And I say, if you want to figure out if school is working for your kid or not, ask yourself, are they highly engaged? Are they consistently engaged? Um, are they bored often? What kind of boredom is it? And then finally, are they stressed out? And what kind of, what variety of stress is this? As a young mother, I experienced a paradigm shift that transformed how I saw education and ultimately the world around me. I started this podcast, The Luminous Mind, to connect with and learn from people who are disrupting the status quo in how they learn, educate, and live in the world around them. Prepare for a paradigm shift. Light a candle, light your world. Benjamin Franklin said, instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. You're listening to The Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Blake Bowles. Blake is the founder and director of Unschool Adventures and the author of Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? The Art of Self-Directed Learning, Better Than College, and College Without High School. He hosts the Off the Trail Learning Podcast and has delivered over 75 presentations for educational conferences, alternative schools, and parent groups. Blake and his work have appeared on the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, BBC Travel, Psychology Today, Fox Business, TEDx, The Huffington Post, USA Today, NPR Affiliate Radio, and the blogs of Wired and The Wall Street Journal. In 2003, Blake was studying astrophysics at UC Berkeley when he stumbled upon the works of John Taylor Gatto and Grace Llewellyn and other alternative education pioneers. Deeply inspired by the philosophy of unschooling, Blake custom designed his final two years of college to focus exclusively on education theory. After graduating, he joined the Not Back to School Camp community and began writing and speaking widely on the subject of self-directed learning. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind, Blake. Thank you for having me again, Rebecca. I'm honored. (laughs) Yeah, I'm so excited to have Blake back just to refresh our audience's memory. He was episode um, 131, and the title was The Unschooling Adventures to Self-Directed Learning. I must have really loved our discussion because I was just looking at that page today, you know, that old page, and I had at least five, six different quotes. I made one of them into a meme, so I'm like, (laughs) I must have really loved it. Um, What a great conversation we had about unschooling and learning to be self-directed. But let's go ahead, Blake, and tell our audience maybe what you've been up to since our last conversation. Oh, that was early 2016. So much has happened. Uh, I I led a number of my unschool adventures trips. I took a group of young adults ages 18 to 21 to live in Buenos Aires, Argentina for three months. Wow. I led trips to Southeast Asia and to Spain with groups of teenagers roughly ages 14 to 19. I fell in love with a, a German woman and I have traveled all over the place. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> a, a lot has happened. Well, and I've been watching a few of your unschooling adventures. I just sometimes I'm like, wow, what uh, the life that you lead <laughs> is like my dream <laughs> life of what I want to do. So, so that's awesome. Um, we're actually going to talk, you know, in the bio, we talked about a couple of your different books. And one of them was the why are you sending your kids to school? And that's really what we're going to spend a huge amount of our focus on today. I have to really plug your the art of self-directed learning. I bought the book. I purchased it and just stuck it on the coffee table. And every one of my children have read it. (laughs) And I think that speaks to the way that you can really write and captivate teens and kids to help them understand how they can take more action in their own learning. But let's kind of talk about that new book of, you know, I, I was just so fun watching the Kickstarter for that book of why are you, why are you sending your, uh, why are you still sending your kids to school? And just kind of tell us like how you came up upon wanting to write that book and what that book is about, that kind of sure, thing. Sure, sure. Well, I was heavily inspired back in college by the book, The Teenage Liberation Handbook, written by Grace Llewellyn. Mm-hmm. And something that I really loved about that book is that she wrote that directly for teenagers. It wasn't written for parents. And when I was starting to dig into the alternative education and parenting literature, essentially everything was written for parents. And so 
finding the Teenage Liberation Handbook was a breath of fresh air. And I was inspired to write my first book also with teenagers as the audience. Uh, that was College Without High School. And then the next book was for college age people as the audience, that was better than college. And then the one that you put on your coffee table, The Art of Self-Directed Learning, was sort of an all ages book with really short chapters and illustrations, trying to make it very accessible. But over the years, I've realized that my audience is parents. <laughs> and growing up, <laughs> your audience is. It, it is, and it's, it's mostly moms in my experience, and they find my books and they pass them on to their teenagers. And so for this book, why are you still sending your kids to school? I just accepted the reality that my audience is parents and I wrote a book for parents. And it, I think it took me a long time to feel confident enough to write a book for parents because I am not yet a parent myself. I'm 37 right now. And I felt sort of like a, an imposter for a long time writing anything for parents lacking that experience. But I think after running on school adventures trips for more than 10 years, working at Not Back to School Camp with teenagers there for more than 12 years, and working in other outdoor and experiential education environments. I felt like I had served the role of being the sort of crazy uncle to enough uh, other people's children that I could write with some authority on some matters that are for parents. And so this book is for parents whose kids are not thriving in school and the parents think, well, what else can I do? And maybe they have a few conceptions of what alternatives might look like, but they don't really want to do conventional homeschooling. They don't want to send their kid to the Montessori or the Waldorf school. And so I try to show everything that's possible and then bring together all the best arguments for why your kid cannot go to conventional school and still thrive. Well, and really parents hold the, uh, I don't know, I guess the, the freedom of that child in their hands. I, I mm -hmm. constantly have parents that come up to me and say, oh, my child would love to homeschool, but, and then there's always a, a list of reasons why that parent doesn't think that's possible. I think that most kids are more, especially in our world of YouTube videos and kids are easily adapted to learning on their own and we see it all the time but it's really coming from a mindset of like having to de-school that traditionally schooled parent mm -hmm. to help them understand that there are a vast array of options anymore at least that's yeah. my my personal thought about and, it and there are lots of books out there that help parents sort of de-school themselves but i noticed that a lot of them stick to one philosophy or one silo very closely and so there's the book for unschooling parents. There's the book for more conventional homeschooling parents. There's the book for parents of kids going to a certain type of alternative school. And this book is uh, very inclusive of all these different approaches and, and of the full spectrum of alternative options. And I try to draw together all these common threads and say, yes, these are all different, but fundamentally they're asking you to make the same leap of faith. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about why that's hard. Let's talk about why you really don't have to worry as much as you do right now. And so, yes, I'm helping parents de-school, and I'm also trying to do it in a way where they have the full spectrum of options available to them, not just one or another. I love that. That probably will be a quote of like why you'll, you will worry less, <laughs> you know, doing this type <laughs> of education than you would before. I'd also love to hear how you think, I think that's so timely that we're just about ready to release this book in this situation where, you know, 50 million American children are now being, you know, put in this environment of homeschooling. I'm doing that with air quotes, but homeschooling, there was a study that I was reading that, you know, if only 2% decide to continue with this lifestyle, style, that means 1 million children will also join this lifestyle or this. Yeah. And so right. I think it's really timely for this book to come out. Why don't you go ahead? And, and I've had so many people on social media like, okay, if I were to do this full time, what would it look like? And you know, I've had moms that are just, uh, you see that on different boards, you know, of like, okay, so how can I make this work for my family? I'd love for you to talk about that, how you think that, you know, with our current situation with the COVID-19 and these children being home, how that works in connection with your book. It's a really strange coincidence. You know, I wrote this book over the course of 2019 and never expected that something like this <laughs> I don't think any happen. of us expected yeah. this. <laughs> and it's been interesting to follow the media coverage of this because a lot of people are saying there's this big experiment in homeschooling happening. 
which is really not true because it's more like an experiment in remote schooling yeah. or school at home. And I've seen lots of posts from longtime homeschooling and unschooling families saying, we are not homeschooling right now. We are not able to go to the park, the museum, the library, field trips, you know, play dates, et cetera. And so that's the first thing to clear up that's important. I think that most parents are going to want to go back to business as normal once the pandemic is over and school has resumed because a very large function of school is free childcare. And I'd say most parents don't actually care that much about what goes on in school as long as their kid seems to be occupied and isn't coming home traumatized. It's like, okay, you educators did your job. I can go to work and do my work as an adult and my kid is occupied. And so that's the, the sort of practical reality for most families. But I do think that there's going to be some small percentage of families who try to do this home remote schooling thing during the pandemic and probably resisted it, probably gave up at some point and said, this is actually kind of a stupid thing. It's stressing me out as a parent to try to be the cop here, the, the enforcer. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to let my kid maybe you know, do what they want for most of the day. Maybe I'll make sure they do a little bit of the school stuff. And those parents are the ones, once this is all over and their kids go back to school and their kids are kind of miserable back in school, said, why can't we go back to the way it was in spring 2020? I think those parents are the ones who are going to be looking for the homeschooling options, the unschooling options, the highly alternative schools that are out there. And hopefully that's the demographic to whom my book will speak. Uh, well, and I think there are those people out there. I've seen those posts too of like the parent that's like, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, I'm not setting up mm -hmm. five different Zooms for each of my children with their teachers all day long and being stressed out. And, and it is interesting, like Sweden chose to not have their children go home just because then they're like, well, what do our healthcare workers <laughs> and different things like that? What do they do during this pandemic? But, mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's already starting. We're starting to see parents kind of go, yeah, this is is it school is over as far as the school district thinks and mm -hmm. I'm doing something different because most parents do want to see their children continue to learn and thrive and those mm -hmm. types of things but let's kind of circle back and go back to that Kickstarter like I said it was so fun to watch it I was super involved in it you know I had friends that started to really get involved but let's kind of talk about how you were able to create such a successful Kickstarter, maybe some of those challenges that you had in, in getting that launch, because my husband's on a Kickstarter with his hammock company. And it's not easy to get it. Uh, no, successful. It, it's like, it's like a whole business startup in it, itself. It, Yes. It, it takes so much time and effort. Most people don't recognize. How. And the whole time it's going, it, you're working on it. That's I mean, right. That's yeah. right. It's a job. It's not yeah. just there ticking away money. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what a lot of people think. Just, just start a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe and the world will conspire to throw money at you. No, <laughs> no it doesn't work that not way. Not at all. Well, this wasn't my first Kickstarter, Rebecca. I had done a few for my previous books. Uh, which I independently published. And this book is also independently published. And so I had a, an idea of how to go about this, but I had a very ambitious goal also. It was $10,000 in pre-sales. And yeah, that takes a lot of reaching out. I scoured all of my email conversations uh, and sent out emails, trying to make them as personalized as possible, not spammy, to anyone who I had a connection with over the past years. I asked all my friends, all my colleagues to help spread the word. and. I think a few things that helped with this was getting a few other authors in the self-directed education world to take a look at the manuscript, even though it wasn't fully copy edited or proofread yet, and to write some nice blurbs that I could put onto the Kickstarter. I think that helped give me some sort of social proof. Mm -hmm. and, and do you want to like talk about who helped with that contribution? Because sure. they were pretty big names, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there was Peter Gray. Uh, who is known for everybody his loves yeah. free to learn. Yes. Excellent book. Excellent author. Uh, there was Grace Llewellyn, of course, longtime friend. And there was lots of other people. And I think compared to my previous books, I had more academics weigh in on this book and I had more professors, people with, I guess, more traditional credentials because I want to reach a wider audience of parents, not just the true believers who have already decided that for example, unschooling is the thing for their kid, and they're just looking for more evidence to confirm their existing beliefs. But I want to reach those parents who are out there still fully ingrained in the traditional school mindset, 
but there's something inside them, some little niggling voice that's saying, you have to try something different. And so that's why I wanted to have a really broad reach. Uh, one other thing that was exciting about this Kickstarter were the, the stretch goals. And those are the goals that you can set for yourself that go beyond the original goal. And so the original goal was $10,000 in pre-sales, and that was gonna cover all of the publishing costs, the editing, the design, some pretty major costs. And at $12,000, uh, the first stretch goal was for me to create an abridged audiobook of my book for teenagers, because I was already gonna do the unabridged full audiobook as part of the main Kickstarter. But I realized that there might be a lot of parents who want their kids, especially their teenagers, to digest the content of this book. But in all likelihood, as a 250 page you know, nonfiction book, that's, that's a tall order for a lot of kids. And so I thought, I was actually hiking in Nepal when I thought of this idea and I immediately wrote it down on my phone. And so uh, that was successful. We got to $12,000. And so now I'm on the hook for producing that. And then beyond that, I had some other goals. Uh, and I think the most interesting ones to me were the foreign translations. Mm -hmm. And we got to $14,000 by the end, which funded one of the foreign translations, which is the Spanish translation. And so that will be turned into a Kindle ebook. And it will also be, I will make it available for free for anyone who wants to download it on my website, because the Latin American and the Spanish worlds are huge. And a lot of them, for example, Spain and Mexico are at these points where some families are homeschooling, but so many more could be. And so that's something that felt really important to me. And then I've decided to personally fund the German translation because Germany is very unique as, oh, as a yeah. very developed country, which has completely outlawed homeschooling, completely, like no mm -hmm. exceptions. And, and that's a long and interesting tale. So that's where, we, where we've ended up. We've got two foreign translations coming. I actually have a Portuguese translation too that uh, a woman reached out to me and said, this needs to come to Portugal. I said, okay, you do it. She <laughs> said, okay. So it's, it's very exciting. This is much bigger in scope than any of my previous books. Yes, it was so fun to watch. And every time it would get close to one of those stretch goals, I know, you know, a lot of our friends would do pushes, like, let's get this over this. <laughs> this hump. Oh. But I think the German thing is, is interesting. Uh, that was another thing that I saw, you know, with the COVID-19, that now all of these parents that wanted to homeschool in Germany that haven't been able to are finally getting their, their wish, um, oh, you know, with, it's with that. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a giant natural experiment in home-based education. Even if it's essentially remote schooling, it's still something that that country has never experienced. And many other European countries and some Latin American countries there's a lot of places in the world where the freedoms and privileges that we take for granted as, as North Americans are just unknown to people. And so, yeah, yeah there is a lot of, of fertility in this moment. I, I don't know how it's going to shake it out, but it, it could be wonderful. Well, and it will be interesting, too, once I, I saw a tweet probably from Corey D'Angelo or something about that, about how once parents get a taste of freedom, of that educational freedom, this may be a huge um, springboard to, mm -hmm. you know, greater freedoms of what we want to do with our education for our children. So, mm -hmm. Um, do you feel like writing this book, I mean, with our last podcast, it's obvious that you have very innovative ideas about how education can take place and what it can look like and how it can be very much different than the norm. But do you feel like that your paradigm continued to change on this educational you know, platform thing? Or, or do you feel like it just helped confirm all of those feelings that you had before? I think all the feelings I had in 2016 have definitely been confirmed. But again, I feel like I've become more open to many different versions and flavors of alternative education. And I think what I've seen over 15 years, but especially something I've, I've really observed in the past five years, is how often young people are flowing in between different options and different alternatives today. I think it's very easy to conceive of a family just choosing homeschooling and doing that, or choosing a democratic free school and doing that. But that's not what is really happening. I know so many more young people, so many more families that school's not working, and so they try to do formal homeschooling. And then that's not really working, so they do unschooling. But then the kids are becoming adolescents, and they want bigger peer groups. And so they decide to go back into a public charter school for a little while. And maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. 
there's so much flowing in between higher you know, structured and lower structured alternatives. And I, I think that is a really special thing that we have here in the US, the fact that you can go in and out so easily and the fact that eventually if a young person decides they want to go into like a competitive four-year college, it's really easy for them to go to community college or to sign up for SAT preparation courses. Mm -hmm. We have a really great system for helping uh, young people from non-traditional backgrounds get into kind of the next level of formal higher education or credentials that they need for jobs. And that's something I've realized over the past years that other countries really don't offer and that that might be I guess I have a more international perspective on this whole thing now, <laughs> Rebecca. I've gotten the chance to speak in the UK, in Spain, in Argentina, and it's just more difficult to enter college and career if you have any sort of non-traditional background in most other countries. And so That's I guess I'm starting to see this from, from a more like uh, economics perspective or a human capital perspective. Well, and I would hope too, like, you know, where you've been able to do a lot of these unschooling adventures. And I know there's a, a huge uh, world schooling community out there of people who travel as part of their education, you know, that are, they're nomads and they travel around and, you know, I've taught lots of classes on that. We do it more of a part-time situation, mm -hmm. but we feel like that that expands our children's knowledge so much to be able to travel and see the things that mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if so many interacting, you know, if you go to other countries and they see this and they, you know, if there's going to be a bigger push internationally for uh, education to be more fluid like that. Do you feel like like, I, I sure hope places? so. I, I sure hope so. Uh, there are many institutional barriers, uh, but this is one of the reasons why I wanted my, my book to be translated. Uh, this is why I want to build more international connections. Something that I'm actually doing right now as a sort of side project during the pandemic is I'm hosting these free international teenager meetup Zoom rooms where I'm trying to bring in teenagers from Europe and from North America, and I've had some from South America. And it's essentially come hang out for an hour and you get to get split up into breakout rooms. And there are three different prompts and you talk about each prompt for 15 minutes with a different random group of three or four other teenagers. And I've run a few of these now and they've been a hit. And so oh, I'm going to yeah. con continue doing this. And, and maybe that is a way in which these ideas can cross pollinate and get into the, the other countries where they're really needed. Yeah. Well, and I just feel like it will make our world so much um, more cooperative and maybe accepting of each other. Um, I know that that's one reason why we wanted to travel. So our children had a, you know, more empathy for people outside of, I and mean, we're kind of this huge giant island where, <laughs> you know, this is America, speak English, you know, type of attitude. Mm. And we wanted them to see like, it's not like that in the rest of the world and that there can be more empathy. I love that idea. I think it's amazing. Well, and, and I love the fact that, that you are, are doing this for your kids and you're helping other kids do this because what we're seeing right now with the, the coronavirus thing is the sealing off of borders. Everything is becoming very, uh, you know, insular and nationalistic. And, you know, I understand that there are, you know, medical uh, reasons for, for doing a lot of this, but I, I would hate to think of a world in which everyone becomes very fearful of traveling, of crossing international borders and, and making those connections, because I, I see it as, as a huge and important kind of humanistic mission to yeah. build, to forge those connections and to keep them going. And so uh, I'm with you on this topic, Rebecca, 100%. That's, that's awesome. Well, what do you feel like are some really disruptive ideas that or unique ideas that you really discuss in your book that you want to, mm. you know, clue our audience into? <laughs> Great question. So in the first few chapters of my book, I cover a lot of the same territory that was in my previous books, but it's just kind of brought to a whole new level of analysis and, and argument and bringing in lots of other people's voices I feel like a lot of the alternative education literature relies upon anecdotes, and those can only be so convincing. And so I scoured the internet, I scoured the entire world for all of the research that exists on homeschooling, on unschooling, on alternative schools. And I brought that together in the book. And so something that readers might like, especially if they're more inclined towards research and, and science, is learning that, let's just talk about homeschooling research. There's a lot of, of bad homeschooling research out there. 
Uh, some of it is politically motivated or, or ideologically motivated. There's a lot of research about homeschooling, which is essentially performed by an arm of the HSLDA, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and they have not done a very good job of, um, of doing highly controlled research. And unfortunately, these are a lot of the headlines that go out there when they say uh, homeschoolers perform better in college than high school students or uh, homeschoolers, you know, there's a, there's a million different good news stories, but most of them are, are, are trash, unfortunately, I have to say. And it's cherry picking and it's anecdote. And what most of the researchers have failed to do is to match when they're comparing homeschoolers to high school students, for example, to match these people based on demographics. Because the fact that, you know, a certain family, for example, homeschoolers by and large uh, are represented by higher income families. And that, as we already know, makes a big difference in SAT scores, for example families that can afford more SAT prep courses. And you're saying, so even if they're traditionally schooled, if they're a higher demographic, they're going to perform better yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. that's what the research shows. And so, and so there's, there's some, some bad research, or sometimes there's just misinterpreted research out there. Like a lot of people uh, will look at the studies that Peter Gray and Gina Riley did in 2015 on grown unschoolers. And um, those were surveys. And so that, that's a self-reporting type situation. And what that means is that we might only be hearing the good news. We might only be hearing the success stories. And so it's really hard to do good controlled research. But, but th there is good news on the other side of this, which is that the good research, the really strong research, shows that there is essentially no difference between homeschoolers or between students who go to highly alternative schools uh, when you match them for uh, demographic similarities. And so it, that means, and this is what I say in the book over and over again, choosing an alternative path is not going to help your kid in a big way, and it's not going to hurt your kid in a big way. And I think that should come as a form of relief to many parents, because it means, essentially, you, you can choose between two equal options, the conventional school option or the alternative option. And you can choose not based upon you know, thinking this is going to make my kid better or worse at getting into college or better or worse at getting a job, but instead on more straightforward measurements. And the ones that I highlight in the book are engagement, boredom, and stress. So these are essentially mental health indicators. And I say, if you want to figure out if school is working for your kid or not, ask yourself, are they highly engaged? Are they consistently engaged? Um, are they bored often? What kind of boredom is it? And then finally, are they stressed out? And what kind of, what variety of stress is this? Because there's, there's positive forms of stress, which we do want to invite into kids' lives. You know, think of a kid who chooses to sign up for a high school um, you know, band performance, and they get nervous about that. Well, they consented to it. They, they have chosen this. That's a good form of stress that we do want to you know, <laughs> instill in children. But if it's this toxic form of stress that so many kids experience in school because of the labels that they're given, because of unreasonable uh, workloads, uh, you know, there's a million reasons why, then you can say, okay, my kid is too stressed, they're not engaged, and they're too bored, I'm going to choose an alternative, and it's not going to significantly help or hurt them based upon the research. That's one of the big things that I, I push in the book, and it's something that uh, has kind of surprised and delighted me to learn over the past few years. Well, and I think that's a, a, I love the direction that you're going with that because that's, that's very true. I mean, the fact that you homeschool doesn't mean that your children are going to be X, Y, Z better or, you know, in this or that, but it's definitely the engagement that we want of how, mm. how, how they feel. I, I know Peter Gray has done a lot of discussion or blog posts maybe about stress in children and how, you know, suicide rates climb and mm -hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things. Those are things I think that we really need to start thinking of as um, parents and families and uh, students of like how important is mental health in education and and I think it's highly important because then that can be that can continue on the rest of your life <laughs> that's <laughs> right it's like asking the question how important is mental health in your career how important is mental health in your you know personal relationships it's paramount it's if you don't have strong mental health, if you don't have a good relationship to your work, if you don't have a sense of motivation that's more intrinsic than extrinsic, then life is going to be 
hard. And, and to some extent, some of this stuff is genetic and outside of your control. But so much of this is environmental. It's mm-hmm. about the choices we make and the situations we put ourselves in. Or the choices that get thrust upon you. And I love the idea that you talk about, you know, if a child chooses a stress, but they've chosen that direction, you know, they're more likely to be able to handle that. But when we have something pushed upon us of like, we have to be doing X, Y, and Z, or you have to be doing X, Y, and Z, and it's causing stress and, you know, all of those types of things. I, I really think that, you know, I suffered with different problems with depression because as a child, I was constantly told, like, it doesn't matter. You know, you just have to learn to deal with it. And this has, and so I learned to not really understand my internal, you know, what my body was telling me. I was constantly ignoring that because it was like, well, it doesn't matter if I feel this way about it or if it's not something that I really want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the experts say that I need to do this. And I think when I finally was able to free myself of that, of that feeling is when I really started to heal, you know, my mental Mm. health. And I think teaching your children those types of things of how are you engaged and how are you, uh, how are you feeling with anxiety? How are you, you know, if if we can take that back to, to letting the child direct that, I think that helps in a myriad of ways. It helps, it helps them educationally, it helps them emotionally, and it helps them, you know, uh, mentally as well. I agree. And and something that you just brought up for me is this idea of of a sense of control or what psychologists call a locus of control. And a lot of kids feel powerless in their lives. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like they have any meaningful control. And this is something that I discuss uh, in the context of games and gaming in the book, which is a hot topic for a lot of parents. Because (laughs) the first thing that a lot of kids want to do, especially boys, but the first thing when you give the reins back to the kid, I want to play games. And that is very unnerving to a lot of parents when their kid just sits in front of Minecraft or Fortnite all day long. And they say, oh, what have I done? I'm completely screwing my kid over. The, there's no education happening here. So uh, I take a stand in defense of video games in the book. And here's the perspective I, I come from. I think that young people want to contribute to society. I think that's a mm-hmm. fundamental human drive. Because as as John Taylor Gatto liked to say, uh, if a young person doesn't feel useful, then they are truly useless. And no one likes to feel useless. Yet we have this situation now where most of the jobs in society are not jobs that can be performed by, let's say, the average 13-year-old. And the jobs that can be performed by the average 13-year-old are ones that we have outlawed due to child labor concerns. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so. We we don't want kids to be working full-time in mindless, repetitive labor. That's something we've decided as a society that is no longer acceptable, and that's a good thing. But that means that kids are in this limbo where they're not able or they're not allowed to contribute to adult society. And (laughs) so what do we do with them? This is why we created school. We just, well, at least middle school and, and high school, you know, we just kind of have created something for kids to do This is why there's so much disillusionment around school because everyone senses that it's just kind of a sham. It's just like we're keeping kids occupied for years until they can kind of reach this perhaps arbitrary point of being able to contribute to adult society. (laughs) So what do kids end up doing? They, They look for ways where they can be engaged, where they can feel like they're contributing to something. And I think that modern multiplayer video games and computer games are some of the best examples of that. Have you heard of this book, Rebecca, called Reality is Broken? Uh, I don't think I have. Reality is Broken. Yeah, this is a wonderful book. It's written by Jane McGonigal, who's a game designer. And she argues the fact that so many young people love games, electronic games nowadays, is not an indication of some sort of addiction uh, or some sort of, you know, very sneaky game designer. But instead, they're trying to fill a lack, a void of meaning and engagement in their lives. It's a wonderful book and you only have to read the first third of it. So I talk about uh, her book in my book and I love uh, McGonagall's definition of what a game is. A game is something that has clear rules, a clear feedback system, a clear goal. And then crucially, the fourth element is it's voluntarily chosen. And so like golf is a game, right? Mm -hmm. The goal is to put the ball in the hole. We give ourselves these obstacles, you know, these sand pits and water features 
because if we didn't have those, the game would be incredibly boring. Uh, there's clear feedback. You know, you always know how far away from the goal you are. And then it's a voluntary thing. You know, golf would be totally different if people were, were forced to play golf, if it was mandated by the state that 120 hours of golf per year must be performed, then it wouldn't be a game anymore. And so that's what young people are looking for. They're looking for game-like opportunities. And something like World of Warcraft or The Sims or Fortnite clearly fulfills those conditions, but also extracurriculars in school often fulfill those conditions. Band or mock trial or a sports team, the kind of stuff that kids opt into and they can opt out of, that is the stuff that keeps a lot of kids going to school, not because they like the school work itself or think it's meaningful, because they just want access to the stuff that's more like a game. It's more like this voluntary challenge that they get to undertake. And that is what we need to get kids to do is to learn how to voluntarily undertake big challenges. That is, in my opinion, what adulthood is about. That's what six, being a successful, self-directed, independent adult is about. It's, it's not running away from challenge, not running away from work. This is ultimately the kind of thing that we want to, to breed in kids. And so this is why I argue, let kids do things that look like games, whether that's electronic games or other things that are, that are just game-like. Yeah. Well, and I've actually heard, I think Peter Gray talks a little bit about this too, that um, a lot of times kids will go to gaming because it's the one thing their parents aren't involved in. I mean, we don't let kids self-organize baseball teams anymore. That's all done by adults. You know, we don't right. let kids um, have any access. Like I had so much freedom as a child. Most of the time, my parents had no idea where I was at as long as I could come home as long as I was home by dinner, you know, it didn't really, they didn't really care what I was doing. And we've taken so much of that, that freedom away from children that gaming is really their only place where they can be free without their parents interrupting, you know, or without an adult interrupting as well. There's a, a wonderful article that makes that point. It's called Why Fortnite is So Much More Than a Game. I highly recommend listeners Google that article. And yeah, they say, Kids love Fortnite because this is the place where they are in control, where they get to kind of make the rules and mom and dad are not invited. And think of Fortnite, not like some, I don't know, like Super Mario Brothers in the, in the 1990s. Think of it as the roller skating rink in the 70s or the mm -hmm. mall in the 80s and 90s. This is a, a young person's world where they get to go. Or the playground. <laughs> I mean, our, our parents were never on the playground with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Playgrounds before, you know, supervision became this, this massive thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I also love the idea of kids, you know, I've seen that with my own teens, that when they are given purpose and a reason, I really wish we could get back into apprenticeships. You know, like you said, you don't mm -hmm. want children working, um, you know, eight hour jobs to provide for a family or whatever, but you, I would like to see where there's more interaction with adults in, you know, apprenticeships to really see if a child really is interested in that. And I think the more interaction that we have with adults, adults, um, where adults have with children and then children have with adults, it opens up, um, first of all, we see how capable our young people mm -hmm. are. Um, that was, that's one thing my teens have hated. They feel shunned by adults a lot of times, like that they're too stupid or they're, mm -hmm. they're just um, dumb teenagers or that they're, you know, whatever. And, and when you're with them and you see it, it's shocking. Um, there is a hierarchy of age, you know, somehow we think that because we're 20 years older or something that those children should listen to us, but we don't have a responsibility to listen to them as well. And I'd love to see, you know, like, I guess more <laughs> crossbreeding in that direction as well. But uh, is that part of like, with your book, um, do, you, do you talk about any of those adult child relationships as well? Or? I do, and I draw on a lot of the work I've done with Unschooled Ventures, and I provide a lot of concrete examples. There's a section of the book, which is very long, called How to Engage a Teenager, and it's about the different flavors of hands-on activities. This is all non-screen stuff that, that I have seen be very successful with getting teenagers to, to get into things and to participate, because yeah, a lot of parents say, oh, my teenager's just not interested in anything that I have to offer. And I think that's true. And, and there, one big reason might be because a parent is offering it. I think mm -hmm. there's a big role in, in non-parental <laughs> adults, you know, playing a role in the young person's life, whether or not they go to conventional school. And so some of the things that I mentioned are uh, 
experiences in wilderness, experiences in group living with strangers. Uh, a quick example is I ran a program called the Writing Retreat for a number of years where uh, I would rent out a youth hostel and we would bring a group of, of teenage unschoolers in and some adult staff and just take it over for a month and everyone would work on their own independent writing project. And just the simple fact of living in a, a dorm room with you know, four beds or six beds that alone is enough to push, let's say, a kind of slobbish 15-year-old out of his, his slobbish habits because he's getting called out on leaving his stinky socks out or not cleaning up after himself in the kitchen. And that's something that a parent can try and try and try to, you know, to mm -hmm. instill a sense of, of cleanliness. But if it's coming from peers and it's coming from non-parental adults who the kid has a positive relationship with, then that message is delivered much more <laughs> rapidly and, and powerfully. And it's funny to listen to your teens complain about other teens' messes too. <laughs> <'Cause you're laughs> like, wow, that must be so frustrating for you. <laughs> I've had that experience myself. So. Yeah. And oh, I, I, I agree with your desire to bring back apprenticeships. I think that in many ways, it, it's just not feasible anymore in the way that we, we imagine an apprenticeship to have worked a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago, it, just because of the way that work has transformed in the direction of knowledge work. But something that teenagers can do, they're capable of doing, they often want to do, is they want to have relationships with working adults and figure out what the work is like. They don't want to go blind into the, you know, the world of, of career options because that's a very terrifying prospect and that's sort of our default path now. Just get a bunch of formal education under your belt and then hope for the best when you get out there. You have no idea what you're walking into. And so a lot of my one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentorship work with teenagers has been helping them reach out, usually via email, to strangers who have interesting jobs or careers and try to ask for a 30-minute coffee date. Uh, to Nowadays, it would be a Zoom date, but uh, essentially an informational interview and what do you have to lose as a teenager well, trying and to set something up like that? Yeah, and a lot of adults, actually, I've, my own children have done that. You know, they'll yeah. get a hold of a lawyer and like, hey, can I shadow you for half a day or whatever? And That's right. many adults, you know, they find it as being a compliment to yeah, them. Yeah, it's, it's flattering. Yeah, it's very to, flattering. to talk about your work to somebody who actually cares. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I don't want to move on to our ending discussion. Is there any more you know, other messages that you want about your book to be revealed to the audience? <laughs> revealed. Well, well I don't know. <laughs> in in mid-May, and so uh, secrets won't last you very long. Um, I've got a, a great chapter on the question of college and kind of who should go to college, uh, when is it worth it to go to college, and I, I juggle two very different perspectives. One, the really hard-headed economic return on investment perspective. And then two, the sort of, how do you build a life of the mind perspective? How do you, you get enlightenment from something like college? And I try to balance those two. But it, uh, I think if I have to talk about just one other thing from the book, it's uh, chapter four, which is titled, You Have Less Control Than You Think. And this chapter summarizes all of the research I've done in over the past four years into the parenting literature. And by far the most interesting book that I've discovered in my research is The Nurture Assumption by Judith Rich Harris. And essentially this book, it's like, it's a complete antidote. It's a complete 180 degree uh, twist on the modern dogma of parenting, which, which is what sociologists call intensive parenting. And intensive parenting has come about for a number of reasons which I go into in the book, which are pretty fascinating. But at the end of the day, it's a hyper-controlling, micromanaging, you know, high anxiety way to be a parent. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's what another sociologist calls parental determinism. The idea that parents have almost total control to shape the long-term outcomes for their kids in both directions, positive and negative, which makes it an extremely high stress position to be in as a parent. Again, I don't have kids. And so I'm seeing, you know, this is what I've observed. This is what I've read. And I've read a lot of the research. Maybe my, my tune will change a little bit when I'm a parent. <laughs> and I, I start doing some of this intensive parenting stuff too. Uh, long story short, I take a big swing at this modern dogma of intensive parenting. I draw on a lot of research 
uh, largely thanks to this book, The Nurture Assumption. And the, the message from that book and the message from the chapter is you don't actually have as much control as you are led to believe today um, over the long-term outcomes of uh, how your kid is going to turn out. You have passed on your, your genes to them, and that has done roughly 50% of the work. And then the other 50%, there's, there's nature and nurture, there's you know, genes and environment. The other 50% is indeed the environment, but it is not necessarily parental nurture, you know, kind of intentional action by parents. It is much more likely to be the peer environment. And so, yes, kids are, are, are nurtured and shaped by the environment, but it's, it's largely outside of your control. To a certain extent, parents can control the peer environments of their kids. And I think that's a big reason for deciding to like take your kid out of school if there's a really negative and destructive peer environment there and finding some other place, some small, more nurturing alternative school or a local homeschool cooperative, finding some place else where there's kind of a better peer environment for your kid. But at the end of the day, all you can be to your kid is, is their coach, is their consultant. Uh, I love the analogy of, of a parent as a business consultant. A parent does have more expertise than their kid. Like if, in, in general, life matters, just like a business consultant should have a lot of expertise in, in her domain. Just because you and, have that experience. I mean, you have life experience, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so then a, a good business consultant will get to know their client's business. They will make specific suggestions. But at the end of the day, they're not going to, to lose it if their client's business fails. They realize that there's a certain separation of priorities and responsibilities and interests. And in, in this analogy, this means a parent recognizing that their kid is a separate person. It's like it, they are their own person. They have to be allowed to make their own choices, make their own mistakes and to too closely identify and to then too closely control one's kid often leads to, to very negative consequences. Most importantly, uh, you wanna have a good long-term one-on-one relationship with your kid. In the same way you wanna have a good one-on-one long-term relationship with your siblings or your spouse or your friends. And if you try to exert the same kind of control and micromanagement over these other people in your life that the typical parent does with their kid, how long would that relationship last? It would. How, <laughs> yeah. how good would it be? I think that's the problem with most divorces, right? We're trying to control each other. <laughs> so, that's right. So, well, and I, I want to back what you say. I think when I finally, as a mother, uh, there is a lot of pressure put on parents of your, you know, if you're being a mm -hmm. good parent. I mean, I think the COVID-19 situation is almost, it's mirroring that. Because when my parents were younger, we were sent out to get chicken pox from all the other kids. And, <laughs> uh, but now it. here here we are, we're stuck inside. We're worried that if we're, we're not a good parent, if we have our children out on the playground doing whatever, that we have to be constantly um, watching them um, because they're not in school, basically. You know, we have to be micromanaging everything. And, but when I finally, as a parent, thought of myself more as a coach, a mentor, um, my own mental health was better. <laughs> you know, mm. I wasn't... I was, and then if my kids screwed up, it was, it was like, yeah, these are their choices. It's not reflective of me as a parent. I think it's a very powerful message, and I think it can help a lot of adults with better mental health as well. Uh, yeah, and, and your mental health needs to be okay. Otherwise, you're going to be a crappy parent. It's like, yeah. That's not a controversial statement. You have to be happy too. And so that it's almost like a call for a bit of self-centeredness again for parents, but that that's not quite right. But mm -hmm. anyways, there's a lot of nuance here. I invite you to, to dive into it in the book. That's great. All right. Well, we'll kind of go on to some of our ending stuff. I'd love to hear like what you're doing now. You've got a podcast and just like we talked about in your intro, uh, some of the different things. Just tell us where our audience can find other stuff that you're doing after they read this the fabulous book that you've got going on. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a website, BlakeBolds, B-O-L-E-S dot com, and that's where you can find everything, the writing, the podcasts, my email newsletter, those online meetups for teenagers I've been organizing, and anything else that I, I dream up. And really, that's where I am at this moment, Rebecca. I am open to new possibilities, new collaborations. I've been winding down unschooled ventures, mostly for personal reasons, because, um, well, if you do anything for a full decade... Kind of, you're ready to start moving on to something else. And so I am looking for, for new opportunities. And so if there's any readers out there uh, or listeners who think 
<laughs> maybe we should work together. Well, let's talk, send me an email. Um, but after this book is published, I will uh, do as much travel as I can, given the circumstances. And I'm, I'm on sort of a sabbatical right now. I was doing a cross-country bike trip, actually, before coronavirus hit. And then I, I was forced to skedaddle to my, my finishing point. That's interesting. Well, and so is that part of your long-term goals and where you see your future is just um, being, you know, that collaboration with a lot of different groups or? Perhaps, you know, it, this is the question we have to ask ourselves every year. You know, where can I do the most good? Where can I have an impact? I've really enjoyed working with small groups of teenagers, taking them on international trips. Uh, but the writing and the speaking and the podcasting has felt more significant in recent years. Like I'm, I'm doing more good with that work. And I've considered staying put and maybe getting associated with a large alternative school. Uh, I might continue to, to do the writing and speaking stuff. The world is my oyster. I'm 37 and the world is still my oyster. That's how it feels, at least for Rebecca. <laughs> well, and that's great that when we, we come to an age where it's like, okay, move me in the direction that I, you know, I need to go now versus where I have to go to survive, you know, type of thing. So I think that's great. Well, do you have any final parting advice for our listeners? And then give us your contact information where we can find out, you know, how we can make these collaborations work. <laughs> Yeah. I, again, the best place to find me, blakebowles.com. Um, you can send me an email through that website. Final parting advice. Oh my gosh. If you have a friend out there whose kid <laughs> kind of enjoyed their time at home after the pandemic or, or during the pandemic, suggest that they, they check out my book. Suggest that they check out more interviews on, on your podcast, Rebecca, with educators and parents. Um, just nudge them into doing, I, I imagine that people who are listening to this podcast are mostly already the true believers. And so I guess I want to say, this is a great opportunity for all of us who already have a lot of exposure to these different ways of thinking about education and learning and parenting to do those little nudges, not big pushes, just a little bit of strewing, as the young mm -hmm. schoolers say, leave an article here, leave a book here, email a podcast to someone. This is a great moment to do that. And then we can we can keep spreading this, this really wonderful philosophy and approach uh, a little bit more across the world. Well, and I think we all have those friends, you know, that will come up to us um, and say, I would do that, but, or my child would love it if I did what you're doing, but, and maybe helping to give them options, you know, and, and like you said, just giving them tiny little nudges goes a long way. I know a lot of I have a lot of friends that joined the movement. I, I'll put that in air quotes too, but the, sure. you know, um, this type of lifestyle when they got that nudge because they were already feeling like, I love at the beginning how you're talking about the tiny little inklings inside those tiny little stirrings. It's like something's not quite right, but I don't really know what, and I'm feeling drawn towards something, but it's, you know, out of my knowledge base <laughs> type of thing. So I, I definitely think we can do a lot to mentor our friends for sure. Uh, but thank you so much, Blake, for coming on and talking to us about this really important book and all these topics that we've talked about of, a, you know, do we really have to continue to send our kids to school and what they can gain outside of that? I really appreciate it. Once again, we've been talking with Blake Bowles and you can find his information at blakebowles.com. But thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Let's do it again in four years, Rebecca. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind music featured in this episode from scott holmes to learn more about our podcast check us out at theluminousmind.net <laughs>